All right. Looks like we are live and I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie. I am your host and moderator for tonight's event. It is a privilege, as always, to have Paul Price here with me on the program. Now, Paul specifically joins me tonight for a presentation that is guaranteed to get the objective viewer thinking. Paul will be discussing dinosaur bones that should not exist. Get ready to hear about some incredible evidence for young earth creation as my brother Paul here focuses on the Liscombe bone bed and the unpermineralized hadrosaur bone. Now, immediately following this presentation, we will be opening up the mic for discussion and debate on the topic. As always, we strive to keep the open debate uh, portion professional as we engage one topic at a time. Paul, my brother, it's great to have you as always. And before we get into your presentation, I do want to ask you, how have you been? And also, uh, for the audience's sake, anybody unfamiliar with who you are, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, as always, Donnie, for inviting me out uh, to speak to the crowd here at Standing for Truth. And, um, you know, I, I think most of the crowd has uh, at least the gist of my backstory. But, you know, for those who are new, I, I got into apologetics all the way back in high school. It's been very important to me as a Christian because, you know, I understood from a young age that you have to be able to give a defense for what we believe as Christians. You have to be able to give evidence and good, solid reasoning to back up your claims as a Christian. It's not uh, as the atheists and skeptics want to caricature and straw man. Uh, it is not a blind faith that we follow as Christians. It is not a, an ancient uh, mythology invented by ignorant sheep herders about a sky daddy you know it's not it's not uh it's not the flying spaghetti monster it's not any of that nonsense this is a rational faith and it is a supernatural worldview so that's not something we run from but we also don't run from a an informed evidence-based discussion of the faith and the reasons why we believe amen well said, Paul. And I do want to recommend your podcast, Paul and Marty's podcast. So I've got the links here. You can be Center. sure YouTube will not be recommending it. So we, we've, we've committed one too many faux pas already. Um, I'm already on YouTube's hate list on my... <laughs> that didn't take long, brother. It didn't take long. I, I'm, you know, I, I talked about one too many controversial topics. So, um, you know, I would encourage everybody, uh, if you're interested in a discussion with myself and my pastor, Marty, who's also somewhat, uh, you know, YouTube famous himself from a, a documentary to going back uh, about a decade now um, called The Norden that was done. Uh, and, and he was featured in one of the episodes of The Norden. Uh, where he went out to Scandinavia and got interviewed. So, uh, but the, the two of us just like to have fun and, and talk and banter and talk about current events, talk about end times, talk about anything, uh, honestly. Um, but I also want to uh, give a shout out to Donnie and his channel because, you know, it's getting a lot harder now than it ever has been to, to run a successful YouTube channel. Uh, YouTube is reaching a saturation point. So many people are on YouTube making videos, so it's highly competitive. And then as Christians on top of that, we have to swim against the current of what the type of content that YouTube wants to promote in the first place. So uh, a lot of you, um, you know, if you're not subscribed to Donnie, get subscribed. And, you know, I wrote an echo. I wrote a, an article uh, for CMI called Shatter the Echo Chamber because the internet is an echo chamber. Uh, I, I encourage you to talk about Donnie's channel and talk about good apologetics content to your real life 
friends and relatives in real life. That's the only way to uh, to shatter the echo chamber of the internet. Amen. So, uh, do share on social media, but also share in real life. Amen. Well said, Paul. I really appreciate that. That's encouraging. And it's always encouraging to have somebody as well-informed, well-rounded, and equipped on these topics here to convey this information, not only to myself, but of course, the audience. And so if you want to see more from Paul, of course, check out his, his podcast. I love the style, you and Marty, the way you engage each other. It's very natural, organic, and engaging. And if the audience checks the description box of this video, you'll find a link to our website under uh, guests. You can go to Paul Price, see all of his previous shows he's done here with us. One I highly recommend was close to the end of 2023. We did a genetic entropy open mic debate as well, which was a ton of fun. It's received some good feedback. In my opinion, it showcased just how powerful uh, the evidence from genetic entropy is. And so, Paul, you've done some excellent work. I highly recommend uh, people check out your other content as well. So with that, I think we're just going to get right into it then, Paul. I'm excited to see what you are going to present. I know the audience is as well. So to the skept uh, skeptics and critics out there, make sure you're taking notes. Make sure you're uh, ready to go for our open mic portion. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. So, <clears throat> Paul, my brother, we're going to hand it over to you. And if you'd like me to get your slides up now, I can certainly do so. Please do. Yep. Yep. Okay. And I, I don't anticipate that the presentation section is going to take too, too long. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try not to get too much into the weeds and, and bore people, but I'm going to touch the important points. And then uh, obviously in the open mic, if there's anybody in the audience that wants to explore into any more detail, we can. Uh, but let's go and, and start now uh, talking about these unfossilized or unpermineralized dino bones, if you're ready, Donnie. Yes, I'm good to go, Paul. <clears throat> Very good. So the weird fossils that utterly demolish long ages in geology. That's just a little bit of an inside joke, but uh, you'll, you'll see here shortly what that refers to. Back in 2015, which was my first year working at Creation Ministries International, which, by the way, I do not work at that organization today, so I'm not representing them tonight. I'm just a, a free agent, if you will, a uh, an amateur, uh, once again, in the world of apologetics. Uh, but I did have a stint there. And my first year, back in 2015, uh, after I had demonstrated uh, something of an aptitude for writing, the first story I was assigned to write on was a recent news article about a new species of duckbill dinosaur or hadrosaur uh, that is uh, that had been discovered around that time uh, from a bone bed in northern Alaska called the Liscombe Bone Bed. You might notice in this old picture here uh, a somewhat increased quantity of hair uh, coming on the the forehead region. I uh, I think my last debate on Donnie's channel, someone commented that I don't have a forehead; I have a five head. So I appreciated that that joke as a as a good dad joke. So. Uh, I'm going to repeat it here, but uh, sadly, uh, that is the uh, the progression there. Uh, but so getting to this topic of this this original 2015 article, uh, you know what the popular write-ups in the media somehow, and I would say either ridiculously, I, I don't know who was who was at fault here. Let's put it that way. But these articles all uh, failed to mention what is probably the most remarkable aspect of these bones is that they're not, in fact, fossilized. Or to be more specific, they are not permineralized, which is the process of complete mineralization throughout the bone. In essence, these were just old, frozen, or partially frozen bones that they pulled out of Alaska. Not, not really fossils, except in a technical sense, but that in essence, they're, they're just old bones. And that's remarkable. Uh, I wrote two articles on this. The first, as I said, in 2015. Then I actually wrote a follow-up to it in 2016. So for those of you who uh, still read articles, uh, I'm going to put those up here. 
But um, what what was interesting is that after that first article, it appears that somebody read that article and then reached out to some type of um, a website that was like a question and answer science website. And then they in turn reached out to one of the authors, not Dr. Mori, who wrote the the article that I was that I was responding to or or writing about. Uh, but they they reached out to one of the scientists that Dr. Mori cited in his article, and that was Dr. Anthony Fiorillo, uh, who is pictured on the right here. Dr. Mori uh, is pictured on the left, and uh, that was actually one of the only photos I could find of him. I believe he has since returned to to live in Japan. But Dr. Uh, Hirotsugu Mori wrote about these bones, and he just casually mentioned it wasn't really the the thrust of his article or anything like that, but he just he just casually mentioned that they're unpermineralized. And apparently, because I wrote about that and that went out on the internet, it caused a stir. A Dr. Fiorillo got contacted about it or caught wind of it in some way. And before you know it, he's actually uh, publishing a comment in the publishing journal uh, on Dr. Mori's article and actually attacking his uh, claiming that he was misusing language by calling them unpermineralized. I detailed all of this in my follow-up article in 2016. Uh, in my opinion, it's actually Fiorillo who is guilty of misusing language here. Dr. Mori et al. issued a response to Dr. Fiorillo within that journal where they stood by their original description of these bones as unpermineralized. And what's uh, more than that is that they're not the only ones who have made this description. In my research, I corresponded with Dr. Margaret Helder, who had, uh, she's well known in the, in the world of creation science going way back. And she had written on these same bones all the way back in 1992. You can still read that article now on creation.com, Fresh Dinosaur Bones Found. And Dr. Helder, this is Dr. Helder here, um, she informed me that she first learned about these bones from a lecture given by the renowned paleontologist Dr. Philip Curry. And it turns out we don't need to rely even on uh, Dr. Helder's word of mouth here either, uh, because after I did some more digging, I found that Dr. Curry and his co-author, Dr. Eva Koppelhus, actually put uh, a write-up on this in their lay level book 101 questions about dinosaurs uh, that was originally published back in 1996 and dr. C Drs. Curry and Koppelhus write uh, a more spectacular example was found on the north slope of Alaska where many thousands of bones lack any significant degree of permineralization and that's amazing. They they lack any significant degree. Now, what they're hinting at here is that there is a very insignificant or very uh, surface level sort of staining of permineralization that uh, Dr. Fiorillo apparently was seizing on as an opportunity to say, "Oh no, no, these are these are permineralized." Uh, but as you as you can see from this clear description. Uh, they lack any significant degree of permineralization. They go on to say, the bones look and feel like old cow bones, and the discoverers of the site did not report it for 20 years because they assumed they were bison, not dinosaur bones. So if that doesn't paint a clear picture, then how about a, an actual picture? So uh, here we go. <laughs> It's it's astonishing to me. We have this picture, but we still have people uh, debating over whether it's permineralized. Let's look at this cross section, and and it kind of uh, <laughs> it's pretty obvious when you look here. I'm gonna now bring us to a full screen of that high resolution image. This is one of these unpermineralized bones, and uh, if you don't know what a, a her mineralized bone looks like. By comparison, let's let's take a look at at a at a uh, fossil bone cross section here that is in fact permineralized. And wow, what a difference! 
That is night and day, isn't it? Wow. L let me go back real quick. Look at this. This is unpermineralized. You can still see the redness on the inside from the proteins. Uh, let's go here. You see any any red in there in the center? No. This is this is permineralized. So why exactly is this a major problem for evolutionists and and old earthers of all kinds? Uh, and the answer is collagen because bones are twenty five or thirty percent collagen, and the collagen is there to give them their structural integrity. It's it's actually the collagen that holds the bone together. It's just more brittle, but it's still there. Are the are these bones being described as brittle? They're uh from the paper. <laughs> You're the one that used the word brittle. Where did where did you get that from? Um, Obviously not from I'm the paper. This from sources that are telling me that bone is very brittle without collagen. But you're not are telling you asking, me. Do they talk about brittleness? Anything, you're not telling the, me anything I don't know. I I don't. I'm not convinced you could have a bone at all without collagen. But if you did, I agree. It would be extremely brittle. You would probably crumble to dust at the slightest touch. Probably. Can you show me that they would? <clears throat> can you show me any evidence that the bones that we're actually discussing here can be described in the way that you are describing them now? Because it sounds like you've just pulled this out of nowhere. That's not how they're being described by the paper or anyone else that I'm aware of. Where did it go? I had the paper here. Where is it? Um... So I'm not finding a lot of specifics, but it does sound like when the bones are excavated from the matrix, so the rocks surrounding them, they are typically extremely brittle. The bones we're talking about here. They are not super permineralized, but that can happen sometimes. Fossils are weird. There's there's a gradient of permineralization. Okay. And I I'm gonna I'm gonna let you have the last word on that, that fossils are weird. Yeah, very weird. So I just played that because this is kind of a representative example of the the typical type of response that I've seen from evolutionists when presented with this astounding evidence. It's kind of just, they don't know what to do with it. It's weird, right? They're just weird. But um, they're not brittle. They're not being described as brittle. And we just looked at a photo uh, it, it's it's being held out in the open in a cross sect cross or cross sected form there, and it's not falling apart into dust. So obviously something's holding it together. That would be collagen. So not only uh, is it unpermineralized, it's full of collagen. Now, what is collagen? It's the most abundant protein in your body. It's about thirty percent of your body's total protein. It's the primary building block of your skin, your muscles, your bones, your tendons, your ligaments, etc. And um, it also constitutes over 90% of the organic component of bone. And uh, the organic component of bone um, is around 35 or um, let's see. Yeah, around 35%. Uh, of the bone is or is the organic component. So doing a little math, that brings us in the range of 25 or 30 percent collagen. So it, if you don't have collagen, you're going to have a major problem with that bone. It is not going to look anything like uh, an old cow bone, right? It, it's it's going to be very clear that that it is highly degraded without the collagen if it even can hold up together at all. So in 2020, I actually had a, a peer-reviewed article published in the Journal of Creation entitled The Upper Limits of Survivability of Bone Material. And it's available in PDF form at creation.com today. Uh, generally speaking, buried bones, uh, this is one of the things that I discovered in my research on this, uh, in taphonomy is the is the is what this is technically the discipline here is taphonomy, but generally speaking, buried bones should be almost completely decayed 
within around 80 years after burial. That's just a rough estimate, unless there are some kind of special circumstances like mummification or permineralization going on. Now, this is Dr. Brian Thomas, and he actually is with the Institute of Creation Research out of Texas. And he wrote his doctoral dissertation at the University of Liverpool by doing an in-depth in -depth study using state-of-the-art imaging techniques on collagen decay rates in bones. So his research is extremely relevant here. A summary of that research can be found at the webpage that I've got on the screen here. But I'm about to bring up a video where he briefly discusses the research that he did. Well, the Institute for Creation Research has decided to publish um, an ICR version of my thesis. And here it is, Ancient and Fossil Bone Collagen Remnants. And on the cover, it shows like blotches of green and red. <laughs> so imagine people are kind of like, what is that? Well, this the, the red blotches actually indicate protein inside this ancient bone. So this is a um, photograph um, using a microscope of um, collagen in ancient bone. And the reason I did my PhD research on ancient bone proteins, collagen being a protein, is because there's a lot of uh, implications for that uh, because paleontologists even keep finding proteins of all different kinds in various kinds of fossils, um, including dinosaur fossils. And I wanted to see if there's a new technique that can uh, more easily uh, detect those collagen proteins. And I found one and uh, I did my research on it. And that's why, that's why uh, my research is significant. Well, to me it's significant because um, the collagen shouldn't last that long. It's like a time clock or, or an egg timer and it's still ticking away. Um, in all these rock layers, deeply buried bones in rock layers. And um, that's consistent with, frankly, Noah's flood having deposited those rocks and the bones that are in them only thousands, not millions of years ago. Well said. The causes of collagen decay, uh, and I've, I've got the source from a, a different PhD thesis here uh, from a Smith, 2002, that the chief causes of collagen decay are one, soil microbes, but two, chemical hydrolysis of peptide bonds. Now, uh, the soil microbes obviously are going to be way, way uh, faster acting. I think we can pretty much intuit here that in these rare, uh, or maybe not so rare, I'm not sure, uh, but in these cases of unpermineralized bones, it seems like soil microbes have been kept to a minimum, but we would still have chemical hydrolysis going on uh, to gradually break down this collagen. What is hydrolysis? Put simply, hydrolysis is a water-based chemical reaction where water is used to break down a specific substance or molecule. It's the opposite of a condensation reaction where a water molecule is used to join two molecules in holy matrimony. Hydrolysis means a larger molecule is actually losing energy through a smaller water molecule Okay, so hydrolysis, it's a, it's a process where these proteins, the collagen, will be broken down over time. And uh, Dr. Thomas experimentally in his PhD thesis research found that the half-life of bone collagen is around 1,678 years at 7.5 degrees centigrade or 45.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, by comparison, that is significantly less even than the uh, the half-life of uh, carbon-14. So uh, this, this puts a massive uh, damper on the idea that these bones could be millions of years old. The collagen simply should not be there. Um, now, one of the things that I sort of anticipated and I thought about myself, well, is it possible that these bones just didn't degrade because they were kept in a continuous, nonstop deep freeze? Is that why? I mean, it did come from northern Alaska, after all. Is it possible that they were continuously frozen for, for all of that time? And that's why 
uh, somehow uh, the collagen didn't degrade. Maybe freezing just totally uh, stops the hydrolysis reaction. Well, even if that were true, I don't think it is, but even if it were true, uh, these bones have not been continuously frozen, even according to the evolutionary timeline. Uh, I'm going to quote here from one of the original articles, write-ups. Um, the northern hadrosaurs would have endured months of winter darkness and probably snow, uh, but it was certainly not like the Arctic today up there. Uh, probably in the 40s, 5 to 9 degrees, was the mean annual temperature, Erickson said. Probably a good analogy is thinking about British Columbia. So, um, cool, no doubt, but certainly not a constant deep freeze. And and you can even just look at what northern Alaska is like today. That's what I pulled it up here. Even today, during the summer months, it gets well above freezing, even in this area, the north the north slope region of Alaska, which is where the these bones were taken from here. Uh, you can see I, the the date that this was this temperature was this past August. Uh, it was 51 degrees. And so obviously it is not the case that they've been kept in a continuous uh, deep freeze for 70 million years. Um, and it's also important to note uh, that these are not alone. These are not the only bones that have ever been found unpermineralized. Uh, I suspect that a, a great number of them aren't reported because uh, it's just too big of a problem for evolution. People don't want to openly be guilty of questioning evolution, right? But nonetheless, I mean, we we saw an example. You can go back if you check my 2015 article and then follow the follow the links, the um, you know, the citations in that article to the original write-ups. You can see that these that these media articles just flat out did not admit or or mention in any way that the bones were unpermineralized. So. What that shows is we're not being told. If they are being found, we're not being told. Uh, but here's another uh, little, exactly the same story, just like Dr. Mori's article. This is a, uh, you know, it, it's it's mentioned in passing, and it's not really, uh, you know, admitted that how big of a problem it is. But here it is, a different a different bone specimen. It also happens to be a hadrosaur, but the, the, it's from the Standing Rock Hadrosaur site in South Dakota. Uh, despite the bones remaining unpermineralized and therefore open systems, our cumulative trace element data support minimal chemical alteration occurring over a geologically short time frame. So unpermineralized, it's not the only example. This is very powerful evidence. These examples, and no doubt many others we haven't yet heard about, are simply not consistent with the evolutionary paradigm of millions of years. Let me add uh, to Dr. Thomas's research, he's talking about like trace trace uh, amounts of collagen. Even the trace amounts shouldn't be found. Uh, but, but what I just showed you in this presentation is way more than a trace amount. Uh, dinosaur bones should not exist for even one million years in an unpermineralized state, yet we do find them all around the world. This is strong evidence that the Earth is much younger than supposed. And with that, my presentation uh, is complete, and I would like Donnie to move now to an open discussion time with what time we've got remaining here. Paul, as always with your presentations, well-researched. I appreciate the visuals and a, a knockout argument there, Paul. Before Thanks. I start bring, before I start bringing in people, I did get a super chat here, and so maybe we'll go through a couple questions before we bring in the critics to engage you. And obviously, this is what your presentation was on, Paul. <laughs> but to respect, I did. Uh, I did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, you just went through it, and you went through it thoroughly. So George Bond, my brother, I do appreciate the uh, support and yes it's a major problem for those that want to believe in millions of years the millions of years paradigm okay well let's let's start bringing in people then and if i know who you are then i'll bring you in if i've never had you on the show before 
I'll just have to vet you in the private chat. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Everybody backstage, uh, I do know who you are. And so that's good. We've got a good mix of critics and non-critics. And so I've posted the link in the live chat. I've also pinned it. And so please, if you disagree with Paul on this issue, you have objections, challenges, questions, then feel free to click the link and we'll engage in some, some cordial debate. And so, okay, let's bring in Doc and... Doc back again. Yes. And we can also have somebody on... Uh, what we did last time is we had someone on deck and then also somebody who's specifically engaging Paul. And so what we'll do is start with Doc. Doc, if you'd like to, give yourself a brief intro. And then if you had a specific point or something stood out in Paul's presentation that you'd like to discuss, we can go ahead that way. Doc, good to have you. Mm, thanks for having me. And um, I apologize for any background noise. My uh, girlfriend is currently making dinner. Uh, no even fried chicken should be tasty. Sounds good. Um, for those who don't know me, I am Dr. Dino, or just Doc for short. I I like to make stuff that educates people about the past, mainly. And I have a degree in geology, and I'm currently working my way into a career in fossil preparation. So I have a lot of experience with fossils. Okay. okay. Doc, appreciate it. And... Is there a specific point or anything you'd like to point to in order for you and uh, Paul to engage? Oh, boy. Well, where to start? Yes, um, I know you've been doing some study and some reading on this, so I'm excited for uh, what you have to bring to the table. I think this will be a good back and forth. Since you were uh, featured in, in Paul's presentation as well during one of our open mic discussions. Yes, I was. Uh, so, Paul, really quick question. Um, do you know what type of rock the Lizcombe bone bed was found in? I probably did originally when I wrote on it in 2015. I can't remember now, but I, why don't you tell me? I'm sure you do. Uh, it was found in a thick mudstone layer. Um, that, that, that does ring a bell. That sounds about right. And... Mudstone is a very poor conductor of groundwater, and groundwater is a, well, in most cases, it is the major agent behind permineralization, and considering we have some bones stuck in the middle of this thick layer of mudstone, it's not very surprising that they don't exhibit very much permineralization. That isn't to say they're not fossilized, though. They yeah, are fossilized. That, I, I understand. They're just not fully filled with minerals. Well, I, I think when I, I and I did allude to that in my presentation, and I understand that technically speaking, you know, it's it's like a, a semantic game. If it's a if it's a dinosaur bone, it's by definition a fossil, right? But um, well, no, not necessarily. When, they have been underground and experienced alteration. They are a fossil. Right. So you know, you can, you can use that definition, but most people, and, and I was using it in the, the common parlance, uh, you know, most people understand fossils to be rock, you know, they, they don't expect to break open a fossil like Dr. Mary Schweitzer has talked about and smell the smell of death. They, they expect it to be a dry, hard no. rock. I, that's what I haven't told. I haven't heard that claim before. Um, no, that, that's, that's straight from the the words of Dr. Mary Schweitzer, but she wasn't talking about these bones. But uh, I'm sure these bones don't smell great, considering that they're unpermineralized. So, uh, but uh, you know, be be it a poor conductor as it may, it's it's not gonna. It is not a perfectly um, what is the word? Um, what's the technical word for for having no water? It's escaping me now. Hygro, hygro, ah, like 
probably no. Hydrophobic. Known. Yeah, hydropho Maybe. It's it's not a perfectly sealed environment with absolutely no water. Obviously, it's, I, I agree it's, that it's not perfectly sealed. Okay, but it is a well, rock layer where you would expect fossils to take a very long time to become fully permineralized. Right, and I think you're right. And in explaining why these particular, because it's not as if all dinosaur bones are unpermineralized. So something has to be right. unique here. And I would agree it's with you that that sounds reasonable to me, that perhaps there's something unique about the particular type of rock that they were pulled out of. That, well, that I, I, I wouldn't say unique, but it is a particular kind of rock, which is fairly common. Mudstone is extremely common but it is a dense mudstone that is a poor conductor of water. Like, it has a very low permeability. That's that's the better term. Yeah, permeability. Um, but it's it's not a zero permeability. It's just low. And not that's... zero, but much worse than no, than most rock types. So well, that would permineralize slower, so this matches with... Yeah, that explains like, why... Not... This is what we would expect. Yeah, we and would... they are still altered. Most of the bones reading from the both the original article and or but reading both from the original paper on the bone bed and others, they are stained heavily with iron, and there are signs of permineralization. It's just not complete. That's and I am reading that from the paper. Yeah, that's putting it mildly. I mean, we saw the picture. It's it's far from complete. It's it's essentially almost not at all it's just a surface staining and, and that's in what that specific story. bone yes i mean that's the, the reason does right. mention other bones that are much more permineralized though yeah that's the reason dr mori chose the word that he chose and he and as i showed in the presentation he's not the only one to have used that description uh dr curry was perhaps even more clear saying that they just were like old cow bones uh but when you look at the picture it's pretty clear and uh, you can actually see liquid, you, I mean, frozen liquid. You can see ice in the middle of the bone. I mean, can, can so, you show the picture again? Yeah. Let's see. Present. Oh, Donnie, am I, I actually am already sharing. You just got to turn it on. Yep. There it oh, is. There it is. See that, see that so, uh, ice in the middle there? That's ice. Is it ice? Sure looks like ice to me. Okay, it looks like ice. That doesn't mean it's ice. That could mm -hmm. also be chalcedony, which is common mineral that is known to be in the bones. Also, this one is cracked open. Like, this might have been exposed at the surface, and it might have gotten dripped on. Like, we don't... Do you know the history behind oh, this picture? I think it's pretty clear, clearly ice, but either way, even if it... Whatever it is, we both agree that these bones have not been kept completely away from all water it's just that they had less exposure to water than your average dinosaur bone which did get permineralized but you're, and you're hence they have a lesser degree of permineralization yes you're, you're agreeing with me of why aren't they fully permineralized but that's not the question at hand today the question is no, I, i'm just saying we have an explanation for why they're not fully permineralized but that's and not. We would really expect them to not be, or at least not to a significant degree. I just want to make sure Paul uh, can tell us what the question is. Go, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, and, sorry. And you have, just you, you the have to on that, Donnie. If you want to bring it down, it's up to you. But um, sure. The question at hand isn't whether or why they are unpermineralized. That's that's a given. They are unpermineralized. The question is, why do they exist at all? Why is the collagen still there that's the do you question know that there's collagen there yes i do uh, do you have a source for that i tried to search for I, something I, when I it came up in your presentation the bone is 25 percent or more collagen and the collagen is most what together Th this is what we do most generally. bone this is but these specific bones like could, could you quick paste the source in the private chat no, you can review the presentation where I gave it on screen. The presentation shows the sources. But yes, all bone is 25 to 30% collagen. This photograph shows a bone which is certainly not 
in a state of, uh, of you know, having lost all of its structural uh, organic component. And it is certainly not uh, falling to dust because it, it lacks all of its collagen. So I can say with, okay. with great certainty, yes, there's plenty of collagen in that sample. Well, and you can sorry, answer. you cannot say that. Well, I, 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 I I'm going to jump. In, I'm going to jump in because I, I notice when there's crosstalk, the audio gets a little bit jumbled and we can't hear all the points. So, Doc, if we could, let's just let Paul finish his thoughts, then we'll throw it right back to you, Doc. I thought he for had. an uninterrupted response. No worries, Paul. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just the only thought that I have to say is that you know, just as happened the first time that Doc Dino and I had this back and forth. You know, he's repeating the fact that, yes, there are reasons why there is some bones are less permineralized. These being an extreme example of of not being permineralized. That's not the question. The question is, why did they survive? And Doc Dino is not even beginning uh, to give well, us. Any answer. All he's doing is kind of gaslighting us of saying, well, how can you prove there's college in there? How can you prove it? Uh Okay, well, I'm not gaslighting you. That, that's the end you of that. You just posed that question, and I was about to answer you. Okay, so go ahead. First off, your source, I did find it about 10 minutes into your open, or into your presentation. That is just a general source for bones. That is not these specific bones. Okay. Now, have some you reason that until, you can find, until you can find a source that tells me that there is collagen in these bones and the collagen content, they do not need to have collagen to remain there. Okay. As I said before, these bones have been altered a bit by groundwater. They have been fortified with iron. They are stained throughout, even in that picture. The reason why it is a reddish brown is because of iron fortification, and that is from your sources. Okay. Donnie, I'm good with that. Okay. I'd like to ask a question. If... For sake of argument, we can agree that the collagen is present. What does that mean for your specific model, Doc, or, or, or the paradigm, the old earth paradigm? What would be the implications? If there's some collagen, that there's some collagen in some dinosaur bones. That doesn't have any greater implications. Like, if we were to expect there to be collagen preserved... Granted, this is probably sort of the environment I would look for. Locked away in mudstone in a relatively cool place that doesn't have much groundwater flow. That's where I would look. But it wouldn't have any impact on my greater worldview. It's just bones with collagen. Paul, what are your thoughts on that response? I mean, I'm sorry. It's it's gaslighting. He's just denying and gaslighting. It, it has no Ow. impact. I, I don't think we can get any further with doc dino because he's just he's just not really engaging the argument he's just kind I, of denying I, so i answered his question truthfully how was that gaslighting okay let's give paul the, the final word if you'd like one but then we'll bring in andrew as, as our next guest go ahead paul you're saying it has no implications for your worldview when i've just shown how a repeatable scientific empirical scientific study shows us that the half-life of the collagen is far, far, far too small, uh, too, too short to allow for it to continue to exist in your worldview. So this piece of evidence is no less powerful than any alleged uh, piece of radiometric dating that you would like to throw at any young earth creationist. Absolutely no less uh, powerful. So it ought to have implications for your worldview, but I'm afraid you're putting blinders on so that you cannot see those implications. And I can't do anything more than I already have done here uh, to try to take those off for you. You're going to have to take those off. Okay. Now, Donnie wanted you to have the final word. Can I have your source for the collagen half-life? Because you don't list a paper in your presentation. Uh, if you'll go to uh, creation.com and search for the the peer-reviewed article I did in the Journal of Creation, it's called The Upper Limits of Survivability of, uh, of Bone Material, I think is the full name of it. But uh, it's on creation.com. You can see the full list of citations there, including the citation of uh, the book that Dr. 
Thomas showed in that little short video, his, his PhD thesis work is what I cited to give his experimental results. But you can also find his thesis work uh, you know, on, in PDF form at the University of Liverpool. You can find it online, public access. So uh, his, his thesis is called, uh, let's see, what is the name of it? Because it there's the there's the ICR published book version, and then there's the original like paper version from the University of Liverpool. Uh, that one is just entitled "Collagen Remnants in Ancient Bone." All but right, either way, some reading, and I can get back to you later. Sounds good. Okay, thank you, Doc for joining us and participating in the open mic, of course, as we move around the room and engage more guests. If another argument or objection or challenge comes to mind, as long as it's on topic, we may have the opportunity to allow you to present that. Okay, so next on the panel, Andrew, good to have you, always fun to engage your, your thoughts and challenges, and so Andrew, how are you today? Real brief intro, and then pick a point or something specifically Paul has mentioned in his presentation and his general argument here. And we'll go back and forth a bit. Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. Thanks for having me on. Uh, hope my audio is okay so far. I always like to check that out beforehand. Okay. Sounds good. Um, yeah, my name's Andrew. I'll also go by a rational empiricist. Uh, I'm a student in college right now. I'm interested in a lot of different subjects about paleontology and such, and I like to argue about these topics online. So <laughs> that's one reason why I'm here. Um, the main issue, kind of something to, to add off onto what Doc was saying, but also what Paul was claiming in his presentation. Um, oh. Is my audio still? I, yeah, yeah, you're coming in good. Okay, sorry, I, I thought I was robotic for a sec. Um, yeah, so the the point I want to bring up is the fact that though some of the bones are less permineralized than others, they are nonetheless still permineralized. And if you go to the original sources, I think you mentioned them. Uh, Fior yeah, hope I'm not mispronouncing his name. Uh, F F Fiorillo, Fior yeah, something like that. Uh, 2010, and along with Gingloff and uh, his colleagues, you find the bones are permineralized, and that I, I think you mentioned that in his comment on the the Mori paper. But they mention how uh, in their original 2010 paper, there is calcite in the bones. There's pyrite. Uh, there's uh, what, what was Doc calling? Uh, there's microcrystalline quartz. I know there's another name for it, but it's slipping my mind offhand. But yeah, there there are minerals in the bones that are consistent with permineralization. So I'll I'll start with that. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I acknowledge that in the presentation. I, I'm just gonna quote word for word what Dr. Mori said in response to Dr. Fiorillo. We recognize that the bones are ferruginous in color, which means rust colored, uh, reflecting some degree of iron bearing mineral infiltration, which technically can be categorized as permineralized. However, vertebrate paleontologists typically reserve this term for cases where mineral infiltration lines the vascular canals and trabecular spaces of bones and is visible macroscopically. In other words, this you have to use a microscope to see what they're talking about here. We are aware that some bones in the Liscombe bone bed exhibit this type of preservation, but maintain that it occurs in a surprisingly small, currently unquantified percentage of bones. So what he's saying is, yes, there's a small percentage of bones in the bone bed that are permineralized, but most of them are essentially not permineralized. You have to use a microscope to actually see the permineralization. And that's what Dr. Curry and Dr. Uh, Kuppelhus also said. They said that the bones lack any significant degree 
of permineralization. Well, well, that was in 1996. These papers are from 2010. And as far as more, what more it all said about iron staining and whatnot that didn't address the specific mineral species that uh, those 2010 papers brought up and that he was using to make his argument in the first place. So I don't really see how that's relevant. Say 2015. But, you know, these bones are supposed to be allegedly 70 million years old. So um, if you're telling me it's it's invalid to, to quote someone describing them, and, and not just anyone, but a recognized uh, authority in the field of paleontology, if you're saying I can't quote somebody from 1996 describing... I, I wasn't saying that. I was saying well, science changes over time, so... These bones change in their... Do you think that they've gotten less permineralized? Or, or more permineralized since 1996? Well, they could have been analyzing different samples at the time. I'm not saying all the bones are completely permineralized, but a lot of them do show signs of at least some permineralization. According to Dr. Mori et al., uh, the majority of the bones in the Liscum bone bed are actually unpermineralized. Right, so and other papers disagree with that figure. Show me a citation. The only the only people I'm aware of that have that have tried to controvert what Dr. Mori said was in fact Dr. Fiorillo, and he was just mincing words about you know he he was he was trying to seize on this uh, the technical term because of this exterior staining on a microscopic level. I just of, mentioned the mineral species in the bone that he used as evidence for permineralization. So he wasn't just pulling this out of thin air. Well, I didn't say he was, but, but the fact remains that the mineralization is, is microscopic and surface level only. And, and that's what you can see in the photo. Also, well, sorry photo if I may, photo. Fiorillo yeah. in his publication was very, he was pretty precise with what he was talking about. Paul, before you respond, I do want to make sure we're going one at a time. No problem, Doc. If you do have a, a point to make uh, later that's novel, we can engage that. Paul, feel free to respond to Doc, and then we'll go back to well, respond. No, I mean, I, I don't think anybody here tonight yet has a, has actually added anything to this discussion. All they're doing is just repeating what I already said. You know, there was this debate where Fiorillo wanted to say, yeah, technically there is this mineral infiltration on a microscopic level, and it's a very surface level. But uh, Dr. Mori did he et say al it was surface level though? Yes, and Dr. Mori et al did? responded in the journal to Dr. Fiorillo, and they stood by their description. So this and is what not. What paper did Mori et al use to make that argument? What paper did they base it on? They based it on their actual firsthand. Well, uh, their arguments were based on Fiorillo and Gengloff. What's in that? Their twenty ten papers. What's that? The, the argument that Mori et al. was making about the lack of permineralization or, or these bones, some of these bones being unfossilized was based on the papers Fiorillo et al. 2010 and Gangloff and Fiorillo et al. 2010. It was so not based papers. on those papers. It wasn't based on those papers. If you want to argue that the, the way that they worded the citation was misleading, you can. But that, they're that's how citations of, work. How can you have a misleading citation? Their, their description of the bones was not based on anything Fiorillo said, because if you go back and read Fiorillo, he didn't say anything about these bones being unpermineralized. He did, and, but he did mention the, the specific mineral species found in the bones that are indicative of permineralization. I can quote you right, right here. I, I, you're not I, I have it here, actually, if I could read a little bit. You're, you're not saying I have to be Sure. Andrew, you kind of cut out there or roboted. Can you reiterate the last two seconds of what you just said? Yeah, I was saying Doc can, if he wants to share his screen, and then if if that's different from what I was going to show, then I can share my screen and Paul can respond. Oh, uh, I think it's the same. I was just saying I have it up. Paul? What would you like? How would you like to proceed? Uh, I don't. I don't know. I can't figure out what kind of argument they're trying to make here. They're trying to say, well, Doctor Fiorello said that there was some mineral infiltration, a little bit of it, and 
uh, Dr. Mori confirmed that, yes, but it's surface level. It doesn't line the interior uh, cavities of the bone. It's superficial. It's microscopic. You, you can't see it macroscopically at all. And, and you can also see that very clearly in the photos that I shared. And I also shared a side-by-side -side with, with an example of a permineralized bone. So if you don't believe these scientists in their writing, just look with your own two eyes. And it's very obvious that the, that the uh, permineralization, if, if there is any, it's not enough that you can see it with the naked eye. And it certainly hasn't penetrated in to the interior of the bone. But you would agree there is some, it's just microscopic at the very least. Yeah, and I said that in the presentation. Okay, good. Sorry, um, if I could read here. Uh, as stated by Gangloff at Fiorillo, Fiorillo 2010, there is common to abundant occurrence of minerals such as pyrite, calcite, and chalcedony within the dinosaur bones collected. All these minerals are commonly introduced during the permineralization process. Yep. And then in Maury's response, we did not contend that bones are never uncrushed or per unper. We did not contend that bones are never uncrushed or permineralized. We recognize the bones are ferruginous in color, reflecting some degree of iron-bearing mineral infiltration, which technically can be categorized as permineralized. They do they what Maury is saying in his response is well, he's being really technical, honestly. He's basically saying that the cavities are not filled with minerals, so he would not call them permineralized. But he does acknowledge that the bones have been altered. Okay. So and so and so have I. Yeah. At, at all at all times. So so I, I, I guess so I'm looking for since I'm not necessarily seeing anything that has gone against Paul's presentation nor Paul's main argument against old earth creation and the evolutionary paradigm. Gentlemen, do you have a, a, an argument or, or a challenge to anything Paul has said in, in terms of his general points here? Well, I don't think oh. you can extra you first. extrapolate collagen experiments today that far back, especially with the variable conditions we know exist under burial and preservation in modern settings. And I would say that. Well, let's do one at a time. Let's do one at a time. Doc, 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 let's just let's do one oh. at a time because we don't want to get Sorry. too many points on the table. No, that's okay. Paul, any thoughts at all on what uh, Andrew just argued? Well, it sounds familiar because um, I, I think I remember using that argument myself in my uh, in my historical science presentation. Uh, you're right. I extrapolating is problematic. It really is because. Uh, the, the further you ex <laughs> the, the further you extrapolate the the more any small discrepancy in your math and and extrapolation requires math and dr thomas used math so yeah the further back you extrapolate the more problematic it becomes not only because of slight problems in your understanding of the math but also just uh, things that you you don't know from the past that might have uh, affected your your well, I, I wasn't talking about the math specifically i was talking about the conditions under which those experiments were done are different from natural conditions we see for the fossilization process no i don't believe that's the case at all because that would mean that the that there was no validity to the paper uh you know the whole point of what he did was to uh was to use the same methods that other fields of science use and come upon a, a very uh, evidence-based figure for what the uh, half-life of collagen would be. So it sounds to me- Some more papers in taphonomy, a similar result? Uh, I, well, <laughs> nobody has given any result in any field, including taphonomy, that would in any way agree with these bones being 70 million years old and yet that's full not of the question i asked um what i will say is that dr thomas did original research so he's he's giving original 
contributions to science here. So no, nobody right, but has that been repeated since then. That's kind of the real kicker here. If it's just the result of one person, that could mean anything. You have to find out if that's a statistical uh, anomaly or not. That's how you do good statistical work. So it's essentially, you're just telling me that you you're just flat out rejecting Dr. Thomas's work. You're you're rejecting. I'm not saying that. I'm saying until it can be repeated, then I have reason to question his results. Okay, well, question away. You're welcome to question it. Um, also, just so to answer Donnie's question from a few minutes ago. Uh, sorry, Paul. I don't think you've really demonstrated that these bones cannot be 70 million years old. You haven't demonstrated the presence of collagen in these bones. The bones are fossilized. They are premineralized. They have been altered. And to what you just said about these rock layers not being dated to 70 million years old or something like that, uh, incorrect. They have been dated using uh, sanidine, which is a volcanic mineral. There's lots of volcanic ash mixed in with a lot of these rocks. That, so that they have been radiometrically dated. No, I wasn't saying that they hadn't been. I was saying that what uh, Andrew just said about it being problematic to extrapolate uh, present day processes into the past is it, nothing if not a massive double-edged sword. It's the very same argument that uh, I and other creationists have been using for a very long time to explain why we're not going to just up and abandon our faith in the word of God and the, the history that the Bible contains because somebody decided to extrapolate, uh, you know, a potassium argon or, you know, any of the other many myriad of different uh, extrapolations that you guys like to use and then claim these long, long ages. Well, right, what's I, I think the, there's a, a big difference there because the if you're using well, I'm, I'm gonna have to jump in because with the audio, it gets it gets muffled, and then we can't hear the points being said. So oh, let's let Paul. That, that's okay. Let's allow Paul to finish his thoughts there. Then Andrew will, will throw it right back to you for uh, an uninterrupted response. Sure, ahead, I, I was basically finished. But what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Uh, if if Andrew wants to say that we can't extrapolate present day processes into the past, that is doubly true if we're running 70 million years into the past and claiming that we can extrapolate using uh, radiometric dating techniques, uh, you know, if you want to cast doubt on one uh, method of science evidence-based extrapolation, then you ought to be uh, consistent and reject the others as well. And Andrew, I would say, up. yeah, so, so I would just say there's a, a big difference there because when you're using radiometric dating, you have, known conditions that would affect the age you get and you don't see those conditions evidence of those conditions today for the rocks that you're dating like you you don't see massive gravitational effects that would affect the decay rate for example whereas if you're so so extrapolation in that area is justified because you you know the conditions pretty well whereas if you have those protein decay or the, the collagen experiments you were mentioning that assume a standard set of conditions like there's there's no variable rate in the heat and I think you like mentioned a specific temperature which uh, like there would be an enormous amount of heat and pressure deep in the ground as well as other effects it didn't take any of that into account so can you extrapolate that to conditions where you know something else is likely going on, I would say in, at that point, extrapolation is not warranted. So there's a difference there as far as if you know the conditions or not. Okay, but if, if there's heat, that's going to speed up the hydrolysis reaction. It's going to speed up the decay of the collagen. So obviously- Have you done experiments showing that with these proteins? Yeah, yes, absolutely. This is, this is basic chemistry. Heat speeds up decay. That's basic chemistry. There, so yeah, so that, that's, all cases, but that, sure. that's probably why uh, we do see these bones. Uh, you know, these are uncharacteristic. It's it's rare to find bones that are quite as unpermineralized as these. That's why they were mistaken for bison bones. 
according to Dr. Curry. And for 20 years, they weren't even reported. So, yeah. Um, well, it takes a, a, a pretty trained eye to find actual fossilized bones in the first place. So they could have just been mistaken for that reason. I will address the claim that you made that we know everything that could affect um, radiometric dating. Uh, what percentage of everything there is to know about physics and chemistry do you do you assume or believe that we collectively as the human race now know? What percent of of a hundred percent knowledge do you think we have? I can't say that because you would have to know the endpoint to begin with. So I would say a lot, but I can't give you a specific percentage. You can't. So, if I may, maybe it would be better to phrase it like, or maybe it would be better to phrase it as everything we currently know within the laws of chemistry and physics does not demonstrate a meaningful way to alter radiometric dates. Right. Right. And that might be the case. Okay. But everything we currently know is an unknown variable. You don't know how much we know. You just know what we know but you don't know what percentage of the total picture that represents, do you? So you're, so you're appealing arguing for a God of the Gaps physics? here? What's that? So you're arguing for a God of the Gaps here? No. You're saying there's some figment we don't know about hiding in some tiny gap? No. Physics is not a figment. You've just told me that you have no idea how much of the total picture of physics and the total picture of chemistry we currently understand. You don't know. You have no idea. Well, if and? that was the case, then you couldn't make a prediction in any field of science, let alone the ones you use every day. Because you, you science isn't based on everything you could possibly know. It's based on our current set of information and how that grows over time. That's the big difference, is that operational science allows us to make a prediction and test that prediction within the scope of our data. But what radiometric dating is all about is extrapolating unfathomably far beyond the scope of our actual data. And that is how a so it's both based on inductive reasoning. How is that extrapolating beyond the available data? It's a fundamental error in statistics. You don't extrapolate far, far beyond your data. But when we're talking how is about it beyond the data, that's my question. Our data exists only over the scope of, of how long we've been, how long has radiometric dating even existed as a field? Not more than 100 years, right? Or, or maybe 150 at the most? About 150. Yeah. But, but with that said, so we yes, have made multiple predictions in radiometric decay, and our predictions match what we find in the real world. For instance, all the way back in 1997, I believe, we accurately dated uh, the Mount Vesuvius eruption that buried Pompeii to within a few months. We have also done that with other recorded volcanic eruptions and using independent counts of age, such as tree rings and uh, varves and lakes. We've gone back over 100,000 years. Currently. Yeah, but those. those and we just uh... keep going. Yeah, but all of those methods you're talking about are are assumption laden, and and we're getting a little bit beyond the scope of what we're supposed to be talking about here. But the reason I brought it up is that you guys are using a double standard. You're trying to throw shade on Dr. Thomas's. We're, we're, we're trying to show why it's not. Uh, a Andrew, standard. Andrew, I just want to make sure Paul can finish his thoughts. Yeah, Go ahead. You're, you're trying to throw shade on Dr. Thomas's extrapolations when you fail to realize that this what you're saying is true in your case to the nth degree because you guys are extrapolating way more than we are. So yeah, good science, you want to be able to look at uh, repeatable data. Um, so I'm not going to let this discussion get totally sidelined into talking about radiometric dating when that's really not what we're talking about. But uh, I will just say that, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, this is absolutely repeatable and we can watch Collagen Decay on a time scale that that's entirely visible to us. It doesn't take millions of years for collagen to, to decay. So uh, this, this, if anything, is the strongest piece of evidence we could hope for. Uh, you know, you want a Precambrian rabbit? You, you want 
some type of really knockdown piece of evidence that just utterly destroys uh, the geological uh, narrative, if you will. Well, here it is. This is it. And all you guys are doing here is just basically uh, denying and refusing to accept what has been shared. Is there anybody because else what you've shared is wrong? That wants to yeah, add in. You're also you're also saying that our dating methods are incorrect, and then saying we can't discuss the dating methods. Right. <laughs> That's kind well, of well, because this isn't a presentation about radiometric dating. It's a side right, issue. Right, but talk about a double standard. You you made a claim. Can't, we can't respond to it. You did respond, but we're not going to make the whole the whole uh, live stream about that. And if the collagen is, if I'm wrong, to? Paul. If the collagen issue presents itself as a differentiating line of evidence that yeah. only the young earth creation model can explain, then the burden is on those that believe in an old earth tonight to engage that, to explain how collagen can last millions of years when it's yeah. demonstrated to not be able to last millions of years as it decays rather quickly. And so this is not an agnostic point like the other dating methods that have been brought up okay this is a differentiating line of evidence that currently the old earth model can't account for it can't explain paul would, would, in that assessment would, would you agree definitely and and what these what both of these gentlemen are doing here tonight only serves to underscore that they can't explain it because they're doing everything in their power to try to to move the discussion away from collagen and towards something else that it seems they would be happier to talk about, like uh, radiometric dating or... Except, you know, whether, you except know, we're not. You, Paul, you are saying that our dating methods are wrong. We are talking about the dating methods that tell us how old these things are. You are bringing up a different point that you don't think collagen can last that long. First off, you didn't provide the source. I had to go hunting for it. I had to go through a 250-page paper. But with that said... The half-life at the temperatures that these bones have experienced over the projected time that we have, they, it would leave microscopic fragments of collagen in the bones still. There would still be something left. Where are you getting that Using from? Using your rates that you showed in your presentation. The half-life of 1,600 and something years? Uh, no, because these bones have been in a very cold place for a very long time. The average How annual temperature is about 40 degrees, or, well, it's closer to about 35, 35 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's see. Let's see. They're not even below freezing <laughs> all year round. Not all year round, but for half, half a year, half and we're going life. by the average... Add to that, that those areas would have been colder in the past, say during the Ice Age, which we've had for the last few million years. Okay, but for 70, the, the bones are supposed to be 70 million years old. So a few million mm -hmm. years is a drop in the bucket. Well, let's go by the half-life that matches it closest, which is the last value, which is a half-life of about 0.6 million years. 70 divided by 0. 0.6 is 116. That's 116 half-lives. Assuming that's accurate. So to, to the 116th. It's just more than negative 35. Well, what is... Sorry, Doc. What 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 math are you trying to do here? What what? First of all, what half life? Are I'm you... trying to calculate what proportion of collagen should be left, and there should still be microscopic fragments. Is my point? Well, what we saw that in is the what your math says is way more than microscopic fragments. But also, which half life were you? You using? haven't demonstrated that's all collagen. You haven't demonstrated there's any collagen in these bones. The bone I'm is, embracing is... a hypothetical. It's essentially unpermineralized. There's virtually no permineralization. Uh, according to Dr. Curry, it lacks any significant degree of permineralization. Dr. Moore, yes, that does not mean there has been none. Well, guys, guys it, it's been a little bit. Uh, I just want to make sure Paul can finish his thoughts. But yeah. I want to make sure we're going one at a time. 
So, Doc, which Half-Life were you just trying to appeal to? I am going by the one that closest matches the current annual so just temperature of the area. Which one? The one that's 600,000 years. That's Where are you getting that? From that's your not, paper. On the chart. Donnie, can you show can you show the chart right now? Yes. Okay. The half life in years at seven point oh, five. That's days, not years. I misread that. Yeah, the half life in years. Yeah, that's my bad. At seven point five degrees Celsius is sixteen hundred and seventy eight years. Hmm. So no, you would not even have any any remaining after seventy million years. That's my bad. I misread this. Let me see if there's any responses to this 250 page paper. Give me a bud. Well, I mean, thesis. It's a doctoral thesis. Yes, it is. Oh, did he die in a car crash? Well, that just popped up. Who? Google Lisa Brian Thomas, an evangelist and motivational speaker, dying in 2021. That's no, news. But... I, I don't think that's the one we're talking about here. No, it's not. Maybe it's not, but I guess another evangelist named Brian Thomas. Interesting. Okay, so how, how do we counter the data that, that Paul has on the screen and how he's been presenting? What's going to preserve this collagen? Not just well, microscopic. He has to demonstrate that there is collagen first in these specimens, at least. Also, I'm not sure when was this published. Like what what year was this paper, Paul? Do you know off the top of your head? Which which one? Sorry, which paper? Oh, 2018. So this is extrapolating based on modern bones. And unless I'm misunderstanding his methods, it is just modern bones placed in different temperature situations. So it's not taking into account anything that could extend that half-life, say iron cross-linking, which, well, we know there's iron in these bones from the paleontologists that have described them. Were the, the bones in this experiment actually buried or covered in some kind of material at all? I'm going back to his methods here. I believe they were excavated. Yes, they were buried. Mm. This is linear regression. They, would have, they would have died. They would have uh, disintegrated from both microbes and uh, scavengers so we know they had to be buried obviously well yeah but uh, we're, we're just trying to figure out if in thomas's experiment if he also tried to put him in a preserving material at all to see if that would affect the rating no this is just you know his his research is on the the basic rate now you can make an argument that there are factors and obviously there are factors other than only just temperature, but there are factors that would affect it. But uh, I don't, I don't think you're, uh, you're going to ever get anything consistent with 70 million years, no matter we how much. know that until you actually do the experiment with all those factors now, do you? So are you giving us a, uh, an old earth of the gaps here now? No, I'm well, saying until we. Or, I, sorry, I, I don't this was extrapolated from experiments at different temperatures, apparently. Yeah. So, and, Donnie, do you wanna, yeah, while these guys, are, they were while these guys are doing some reading, do you want to let anyone else uh, talk about this? Yes. Let's move to the, our next couple of guests we would be on the creationist side. So, gentlemen, I appreciate you joining us, Josh and Brian. And so, if you have a question, Let's allow you to ask Paul your question. And Brian, let's start with you, my brother. Brief introduction. Hope you're doing well. And what's your question for Paul? 
Thanks. Um, first, uh, my mic working okay. This thing keeps on messing up and going in and out. Yes, it sounds good. Good. And good. All right, awesome. Um, uh, I have a YouTube channel in ministry, Apologetics 101. Most of y'all know me. Um, uh, uh, but anyway, um, to be honest, some reason, um, uh, my, my video didn't like the live chat, like, you know, how it messes up sometimes and it moves back. I actually missed your entire presentation. So I don't know what you, uh, I just caught glimpses of it on, on the Q and a, but, uh, I do have a question since it's on unfossilized bone and, um, I'm assuming you're based on what you've alluded to that you are familiar with the uh, uh, find of um, uh, what's your name, Scaly Man, or uh, the one that found the unfossilized bone, the uh, blood sample, Mary Schweitzer, and it wasn't blood. Yeah, there you go, Schweitzer, Schweitzer, that's the one. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, uh, I was wondering, Paul. Um, uh, some people say that 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 blood sample was uh, him instead of actual blood uh, or tissue or, or uh, actual blood. What, what what is your take on that? Did you hear me, Brian? Was that for me? Yes. Okay. I I don't think I understood. Sorry. Bl I, I was uh, asking the question about the uh, uh, um, the blood sample that, or the um, the blood that was found in the T Rex bone by uh, Mary Schweitzer. Uh, I was wondering. So, uh, some people suggested that it was him. Uh, so I think we have to be careful yeah. with our work. I'm not sure that anyone's found blood specifically. Um, it's, it's better to just say. Yeah, like soft tissue, uh, possibly some red blood cells. Um, yeah, it's yeah. it's kind of part and parcel here. Like, obviously, this this concept of uh, the, this phenomenon of unpermineralized bone goes a lot further than what we're normally being told. I think it's shameful that the news articles don't mention it. But, um, you know whichever whichever way you want to look at it uh you know whether it's a small amount even a small amount shouldn't be there or in this case it's obviously a very large amount uh that is there because the bone is barely touched with any minerals it's 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 a only a superficial microscopic uh tinge of the iron uh color on the outside of the bone and that's it so um yeah, you know, whether we're talking about Mary Schweitzer's examples or these, the same problem remains. It's it's very clear from repeatable science that these biomolecules simply don't last that long. And that's why uh, Mary Schweitzer was flat out not believed when she when she uh, gave her, um, you know, results. She was, uh, you know, she couldn't believe it herself till she she saw it with her own eyes. Why is it that everybody is uh, is so incredulous here? Well, it's because uh, it's it's self evident that it shouldn't be there. It's a it's a failed prediction for evolution, and it's a very successful prediction of creation. If if Noah's flood happened only forty five hundred years ago, as Doctor Brian Thomas said, then yes, this is something we should expect to find. We should expect to find fossils in varying states of permineralization. We should expect to find examples like this that are uh, almost completely unpermineralized. But nobody in the evolutionist community was would have predicted or did predict uh, any of these types of finds. And that's not only that, they are extremely reluctant to acknowledge them, as you've seen here tonight. And they are uh, they they even refuse to publish in the popular literature that the everyday average person gets to read. They even refuse to admit what the true state of the bones is, and they just call them "quote unquote" fossils, leaving everyone to assume they're you know permineralized, like most fossils 
are or that we are led to believe most fossils are. So, yeah, it's it's dishonesty. It's absolute dishonesty. It is censorship in the media. And it is this type of underhanded tactic that is keeping the uh, failed paradigm of evolution in the dominant uh, place that it is today. It is it is simply a, a refusal to admit reality and a refusal to report the facts. So, um, I do have a follow up question. Um, um, my understanding is that uh, biological molecules can't usually last more than uh, um, uh, ten thousand years because they, they break down over time. Well, yeah, that's um, that whole argument so here. I mean, it depends on the exact molecule. It depends on the exact. Uh, conditions that they're in. It, it depends on the temperature, all, all these different factors. Yeah. Um, so you can't just put one number on it, but uh, no matter what number you try to put on it, it is absolutely not going to last 70 million years in an unpermineralized state. So no, how, no matter how much it's preserved, it's not going to, to have a, a condition that's going to preserve it that well. Where it survives that long? If that it right? if it were seventy uh, million years old, we would expect, uh, if we would find it at all, we would expect it to be completely permineralized. Absolutely, we would not expect any trace remnants of the biological, uh, the original biological proteins to be there. We would not expect that. So the fact that we do find that is a failed prediction in evolution, and it's a confirmed prediction for creation. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. And, Doc, you said you had either a question or a, a criticism uh, currently. Go ahead. Feel free to present and let Paul respond. Yeah. Uh, for anyone confused, the yellow thing on my icon is just to signify something to say. Uh, it's your so way of raising Paul, your hand, it, right? Yeah, kind of. So, Paul, for every publication about fossils, would you like us to discuss the exact breakdown of every mineral found within the fossil, as well as the proportions of various isotopes, the particular structures, uh, if it's a particular type of quartz or sand or just like how granular do you want us to be? Because if I start talking about hydroxyapatite, I don't think the average person is going to understand that in a press release. Right. Okay. Just Doc, I'm, I'm not sure that's dishonesty. Again, and it's getting very tiresome. How? These bones were, uh, th they were not reported as dinosaur bones for 20 years because they're indistinguishable from modern cow bones. According that, to Doc. That's not what Phil Curry said. It, it is what he said. He said they were not. No, he said from a cursory glance, they looked like bison bones. No, that no is one not. thought to investigate them further. Either. He never used the phrase cursory glance. Those are your words. What he said was, well, you know what? I'll just go and read it because I have it right here. He said, I already, I already mentioned that he said they lack any significant degree of permineralization. There's no question that he's talking about these bones because he said they were found on the north slope of Alaska, and that is where these came from, the Liscum bone bed. He said the bones look and feel, so not just a cursory glance, they look and feel, so he's actually touched them. Yeah, they look... How how much yep. field work have you ever done in paleontology? Let me let me finish. They look and feel like old cow bones, and the discoverers of the site did not report it for 20 years because they assumed they were bison, not dinosaur bones. Now, Doc, over and over you're being dishonest, and when you use this phrase that you made up and put it into Dr. Curry's mouth, that, that they... They look that way upon a cursory glance. That's dishonesty. 
That so, is not. It is not dishonest, and I would very much appreciate if you stopped declaring me dishonest. Okay, well, I then said stop. a cursory. Gl I said a cursory glance because they. So what he is describing here is they found some bones, looked them over, and moved on because they thought they were just bison. That's something you got to do in the field. You got to know what to focus on and what not to. But like, this wasn't reported for, for twenty years. years it says. <laughs> Okay, it's in northernmost Alaska. How many people do you think are out there? I, I don't see the implications from this quote that this was based on a cursory glance. Okay, cursory is my word. I am extrapolating that from what he's saying. He's not saying much different. Okay. Okay. Don't, and me... that doesn't have that yeah, doesn't have anything to do with the main thrust of what I was saying either. We have another it's guy, Josh, hasn't had a, a chance to speak yet. Okay, uh, sure. Don't address me again. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Before I, I bring in Josh, I want to make sure we're addressing all of the appropriate challenges and arguments for tonight. We do have Guts at Gibbon in the chat, so I do appreciate it. Erica has a question or an argument, and so I'd be curious as to what your thoughts or responses, Paul. And she says her question with the soft tissue is why isn't it ubiquitous among all fossils? Basically, she's arguing if the earth really is 6,000 years, we should be finding collagen as being the norm rather than the exception. Paul, what are your thoughts? You know, whether or not um, we that whether any collagen is the norm, I can't answer. It very well might be the norm. Uh, how often have these been tested for collagen? The assumption has been until recent times, the assumption is, of course, there couldn't be any collagen there. So how many of them have even been tested for collagen? I don't know. It could be the norm. But uh, what he what got Gibbon said is that uh, why isn't it ubiquitous among all fossils? Well, I don't think it's it's correct at all to think that all fossils should show exactly the same degree of permineralization because uh, it flat out isn't the case. You know, permineralization happens rapidly or it can. And so uh, there's plenty uh, of evidence that permineralization, uh, as I said, can happen rapidly. So as, as Noah's flood, as the conditions occurred, you're going to have pockets of differing local conditions. So uh, I don't think it, it's something we should expect to see that all fossils would show the same degree of permineralization or lack thereof. I think a global flood is a very complex event with lots of, of locally differing circumstances, and that's what we observe. We observe complete permineralization, and we observe almost total lack of permineralization. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think that's a, a valid claim to say that we should expect um, this type of condition to be ubiquitous. But as to whether or not collagen is ubiquitous, I don't think it's ubiquitous, but I think it's it's very possible that it's way more common than we're, than we're commonly being told. I don't want to misrepresent Dr. Mark Armitage. We had him on twice. The last time we had him on was probably going back a year and a half, maybe a couple of years ago. And if I remember correctly, he pointed out that these initial findings of soft tissue, collagen, they were essentially by accident. They were surprised. And so moving yeah. into the future, now that we're actually looking for it, the more cases there will be of soft tissue, collagen, and these things that shouldn't be there. If these bones really are millions of years, there's there's more than you can than you can count of different uh, cases where various proteins and biomolecules have been documented in fossils. So it, it I don't I'm not going to go so far as to use the word ubiquitous, but right. it's definitely very common. Yeah, a lot more common than than the evolutionary community would want us to believe. Yeah. And 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 as we already saw. You can read articles on it, and and they're just flat out not going to mention it. So, you you really got to dig deep to find this stuff. 
Okay, let's move to Josh. Josh, appreciate you being here. Thank you for your patience. And if you had a question for Paul regarding tonight's specific topic, feel free to ask him and make sure to unmute when you want to speak, Josh. Hey, guys. Uh, how's it going, Mr. Paul? Good. Thank you. So I did miss the first half of it, like apologetics, but I've been watching it like at two times speed, trying to absorb as much as I can to <laughs> provide some useful um, input here. Yeah. So, just so I'm clear, there's a particular bone that is identified as a dinosaur bone that was frozen. They took it out the ice and then they waited 20 years before they mentioned it to anybody. Um, at which point they realized that it was a dinosaur bone. And um, based on what you're saying, that a particular bone carries about 30% collagen. Um, and then you think you said 90% of the organic material is collagen as well, something along those lines. Um, so uh, I guess my first question would be, uh, what is like the testing mechanism for identifying the percentage of collagen left in a particular bone sample? Well, I'm not a chemist or a biochemist. That's a little over my head to explain to you what the, the procedure is for doing the tests. Um, you, you also stated something that was not 100% accurate when you said, uh, you said that they found a bone. According to these guys, they're saying that it's, a, it's the vast majority of the bones, or at least a, a sizable majority of the bones in this particular bone bed are in fact displaying this type of uh, scant permineralization, essentially unpermineralized. So it's not just one or two, it's thousands of bones. According to Curry, I uh, said that um, uh, many thousands of bones from this particular unit lack any significant degree of permineralization. So, so we're definitely not just talking about one specific bone, we're talking about thousands of bones. There's a lot of samples to kind of go off of. Yeah, but no, I can't explain to you the the experimental process that they use to to come up with their numbers. But I did provide citations and and prevent it. And you know that's that's in the presentation. If you want to go back and and check my sources, where I I stated that bones are about twenty five to thirty percent collagen, and that the all of the collagen is the structural integrity of the book. Well, so I think you're being a little dishonest there, Paul. Hey, Doc, I'm still so, engaging him. This isn't. If, if this you don't mind. Speak, Doc. Right. Doc, do you mind if I just kind of finish my line of question? Is Go that ahead. okay? With, is that okay with you, Doc? Go ahead, Josh. Go ahead, Josh. Hey, you don't need my permission. Go ahead. Okay. Um. So. Um, then I also heard you mention something about, on average, let's say you get a, a, a typical bone, I cut my arm off and I take that arm and I bury it in the soil, um, that it would take about 80 years for the collagen to completely disintegrate or decay? or Well, not just the collagen, the whole bone itself is going to essentially be unrecognizable in around 80 years, but that's just a very rough estimate. That's that, you know, again, rough, but yeah, within, and, within a century, let's say, uh, under normal circumstances, you just take a bone and just go bury it in your backyard. You know, after a century or so at the most, uh, you know, you're definitely not going to be having that be recognizable. It would just be like, a, a it, what went in as a bone would just look like a twig or something. It would just it would just blend in with the rest of the soil, you know. So, um, and then you also mentioned that some of the contributing factors are soil microbes, and kind of like the what is it the hydros um, hydro hydrolysis? What was the term? Yeah. yeah. So, would this um, make a difference? Say, for example if a bone was buried in because uh, i know a bit about microbes 
uh, and different types of microbes um, and how they, uh, you know, interact with the soil, how they interact with plants. So would it make a difference? And you may not know this, if a bone was buried somewhere very dry without any vegetation versus if something was buried, say, for example, in the Amazon or in the rainforest where there's a lot of like vegetation, trees, microbial activity, would, yeah. would, you, find, would you find more bones that are preserved longer in that drier atmosphere versus the more active micro um yep. wet environment yep yeah the uh the microbes are the fastest way to decompose the bone so the more microbial uh, activity that you have uh, on the bone obviously the faster it will degrade so and then maybe my final question here so um the whole argument towards why this level of decay in, in collagen kind of defeats the millions of years of evolution. Um, at, at what point does a bone become fossilized and does it stop um, like decaying completely, right? Because we do have, I, I would say, bones that are over 100 years old that have been fossilized. Um, so do is that where you're talking about that we find trace amounts of collagen or the per mirror that's the that's the piece i'm kind of not understanding how that relates to uh arguing against um the, the preservation would be preservation method that that it essentially replaces or or fills in the spaces in the bone with mineral and then the original organic material should, especially if it's millions of years old, it should just have disintegrated away completely. And all you would have left would just be the minerals that filled in those. But that's not what we find. We find examples where that hasn't occurred, or we find examples where it has occurred uh, very incompletely, where you still have original biomolecules present in the fossil. And so that argues against millions of years because as I showed in the presentation, we have direct experimental evidence that shows us what the half-life of, of collagen is. And it is not compatible with these millions of years. It's far too low. And so uh, that that is the argument here is that finding these biomolecules, finding collagen, it's just not compatible with these bones being millions of years old. The these uh, the biology doesn't last that long. It it degrades too quickly. Gentlemen, let me jump in. Josh, I appreciate the questions. Paul, great answers. What I'd like to do now is move to our final critic for tonight, as we've got about fifteen minutes till the two hour mark. Yeah, Paul, my brother, and so I do appreciate your time. Thank you. The final critic was Mr. Anderson, but he just dropped out. So we'll give him a couple minutes here to rejoin, as I know he was looking to engage you I, on. He lost his connection or something. Give him. There we give go. Him. Um, I did have something to say really quick, Donnie, if I could. It thank should you. be Thank quick. you, Paul. Yeah. Gosh. Thank you. thank you, brother. God bless. Okay, let's do this. Doc, if you have something to say. Feel free to say it. We'll let Paul respond. Then we'll throw it over to Mr. Anderson to well, engage Paul for the final act. Okay, so, okay, quick. So first in this bone bed, actually really interesting bone bed, we have about 30-ish individuals represented, a few thousand bones. Many of the bones have light permineralization and they are fossilized for the record. And about collagen and bones, um, so how do we know there's collagen in bones? Uh, there's actually a very easy test. You either cut or grind a bit of it. There is a very particular smell. If you've ever had Fritos chips, it smells like Fritos chips. Really easy method. Uh, that said, we've been cutting up dinosaur bones for a long, long time, and there's not much left when there is collagen present. 
it's rare, so probably pretty faint. So you need to do like uh, you do tests with actual machines. And lastly, Paul, um, do you know what a risolith is? Go ahead. I don't know what that is. So risoliths are root fossils, and just just to let everyone know, um, there are root fossils preserved both below and on top of this bone bed, like a lot of them, suggesting that after these animals were buried, there was lots of time for plants to grow, and then more flits happened in the area. Just interesting. Okay, thank you for sharing. Paul, would you like to respond to any of Doc's first points that he made before his question? No, I, I didn't really think there was anything to respond to there. So let's go okay. ahead with uh, Mr. Anderson. Okay, thank you, Doc. Good now night. we will hand good it over good to good Mr. Good Anderson. Good it good is... Let's go ahead, uh, Mr. Yep, I'm here. Okay, I, uh, maybe there's some echo. There was right. because I was trying to open up a computer and then it, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to talk to you guys that I, you know, opened a thing twice. <laughs> well, we're excited to talk to you. So I'm glad that we oh, share the that. excitement. So Mr. Anderson, great to have you. Hope you've been well. Real quick intro if you'd like to. And then what specific point would you like to engage Paul on? Uh, so I just wanted to make sure, well, so I guess first off, uh, yeah, my name is, uh, well, I go by Mr. Anderson on YouTube and, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a lawyer in real life, but, um, you know, I just, I, I started watching far too many creationist, uh, debates and, and, uh, uh, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't think that, uh, people were asking the right questions. And so I said, you know what, I better put up or shut up. So I threw my hat in the ring and, uh, yeah been uh been learning lots of stuff about uh all this different uh you know all this different stuff and i find it really interesting um now paul i apologize i wasn't able to catch uh the bulk of your presentation so i want to make sure that i'm not going off on uh a, a mary chase here and if i uh but is this uh, were you essentially presenting the 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 position uh, that was embodied in your article, the curious case of unfossilized bones with the hadrosaur and the, um, and the, uh, I can't remember the name of the bone bed. Yeah. Liscom Dr. Bone. Mori and stuff. Yes. Yeah. Now the, the article you mentioned is the second one I wrote in 2016. It's the follow up to yeah. the original article from 2015. And then in 2019 uh, to 2020, I uh, published a peer-reviewed article in the Journal of Creation called the Upper, uh, the oh, Upper Limits of Survivability of Bone Material in the Journal of Creation, and uh, where I went into some of these uh, details that we, we have here in the presentation today. Um, so, yeah, but yeah, those are the bones, the ones that you just mentioned. That's what we're talking about tonight. Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't, you know, herring off on a on a wild goose chase here. Um, so the, I guess the thing that I wanted to talk to you about was so so I do um, so I have read the articles or at least two of them, um, and uh, and I looked at uh, some of the uh, documents that uh, that that uh, were the basis for the articles because uh, as i understand it you got in touch with a couple of the people involved here and what they said was that um that in fact these were actually fossils um and uh, uh one of the doctors actually accused the other one of you know or, or cautioned the other one i should say about the dangers of uh uh, using the word permineralization very loosely because apparently he was using it to say like, look, whenever, uh, whenever, uh, sedimentation, uh, preserves structures like, uh, bone marrow or soft tissue, um, and we can see the structure that that is essentially what I mean when I say permineralization, is that a fair characterization of the, uh, uh, of the interaction uh, between the, the doctors? Not entirely. It's it's sort of right. But what, what actually happened is that 
um, Dr. Mori used the term unpermineralized to describe mm -hmm. the, the bones. And he's not the only one to have done that. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. The, the famous paleontologist, Dr. Uh, Philip Curry, and uh, his co-author, Dr. Ava uh, Koppelhus, also described them that way. Mm -hmm. um, the debate was about is essentially semantics because every all parties acknowledge that there is a light tinge of a of a rust color that has uh, tinged the outside of the bones, and so everybody agrees on that. But Dr. Well, Fear you say bones, you mean the the fossils, right? Well, they are bones. So well, uh, not anymore. My are, are so are you are you taking the position that they are saying that they are in fact bones as in they are not fossils. Certainly everybody agrees that they're red, but when I read the two uh, papers or I don't know what you would call them letters, shall we say that were written by those two uh, people who have actually touched and studied the bones themselves. Uh, they seem both fairly clear in indicating that they were not bones in as much as they're bones, they're fossils of bones, right? No, they are bones. They are not fossils of bones. They are bones. Um, and how do you, and where do you get that from? Well, because they, so the, the reason why they're called fossils is it's just semantics. They came out of the ground. They are alleged to be millions of years old. Yeah. And there has been some degree of interaction with the strata around them that has resulted in some degree of some minerals making their way into the bone. And so on that basis, they're saying these are fossils. But Dr. Mori and his co-authors reiterated that while that is technically true, it's really more accurate to call them unpermineralized because normally what we mean by permineralized is that the interior bone has been significantly uh, replaced by uh, and infiltrated with, um, you know, accretions of minerals. And, and I actually uh, displayed this in the presentation. I showed you, uh, well, I know you said you didn't get a chance, I guess, to see it, but uh, yeah. I showed a photograph of one of these bones. Maybe I can, uh, if Donnie wants to put that up real quick. Yes. I showed a photograph. Sure of one of these bones and then compared that with an actual permineralized fossil example. So you can see how striking a difference we're talking about. So um, are you able to see this photo? I see the first photo. Yeah, I see this photo. You're going to show this, me another photo? Yeah, this is one of the Liscombe bone bed bones uh, that are sure. un unpermineralized. Fossils only in the technical sense, but they are bones. And then uh, comparing that with a permineralized sample of a bone. You can see a, a night and day difference here. Uh, right. So that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about, according to Dr. Curry, they look and feel like old cow bones. Yeah. So they're, they're bones. I, I don't think it's right to even call them fossils. I think it's misleading because when, when people hear that word, they automatically assume that we're talking about rock, that we're talking about it being permineralized. But as you can see, that's clearly not the case. So I think Dr. Mori et al. were in the right when they said they were unpermineralized. Yeah, but uh, Dr. Mori in his clarification letter says, look, when I say unpermineralized, what I mean is that the structure of the bone, the bone marrow itself, is preserved by the uh, fossilization process. And he says specifically, now these are fossils and I never meant to say they weren't fossils. All I meant to say was that they haven't become stone through and through in as much as the soft structures like the bone marrow are no longer preserved. And that when I and others in this context use the term unpermineralized, that's what I mean. I mean that we can see the bone marrow. He says explicitly that does not mean that they're not rock now. They are. 
No, he didn't say that. He didn't say that they're rock. He said that they are what, fossils. He but said as, they are fossils. Yeah. yeah but what I explained and is he that, also said that he also said that when I say unpermineralized, I mean that it preserves the structure. Did he not? I'm not sure if he used the word preserve because the fact is there's no known process uh, other than permineralization that could theoretically preserve a bone over the time span that we're talking about here. There is no known process that could do that. So when you say there preserved, is, it's called fossilization. When you say preserved, you are appealing to some notion that's just kind of vapid, but the the process well, that, I think I'm, maybe I'm a vapid guy but I mean you know all I'm saying is that this this doctor of paleontology who's not vapid or less vapid than I am is saying that that's how he uses the term and these two guys got into a fight over you essentially saying that this was not uh, or that this was an unfossilized bone because the one guy used the term unpermineralized so as I stated right? Uh, so, as I stated, <laughs> the the term fossil, in this case, we can throw that out because it's it's meaningless. It, it the only extent to which it means anything is if we're talking about permineralization. So, what what Dr. Mori et al. agreed, and and they stood by their original wording, uh, that these are unpermineralized. Um, now if they, I don't know if he used the word preserve or not, I would have to reread the whole thing to see if he did, right. but now, if he did, I would challenge him to explain what, um, chemical or, or, or any other type of process can he explain to us that can preserve unpermineralized collagen so, so far beyond its half-life of 1600 and, um, some odd years. So a, a half-life of 16 some odd hundred years uh, is incompatible with a geological age of 70 million years. So that is a, a major issue. That's the issue at, under debate here today. It's not whether or not they are quote-unquote fossils, since that word can just be used indiscriminately of anything you pull out of the ground that you want to claim is millions of years old. The issue well, is I don't think that's correct. I mean, yeah, that is so not the only correct. person the only person who actually has seen these bones in person and whose whose like fundamental work is the basis for all of this is this guy uh Fiorillo. Anthony not, R. Fiorillo, right? No, that's not correct. No, not I mean, well, that's what it says is that Morietto reviewed the uh like and that's why Fiorillo was so ticked when uh, when Mora used the word unpermineralized because Fiorillo says, "quote The bones from the Liscombe bone bed are remarkable, but they are indeed fossilized and they are indeed permineralized." End quote. Yeah, that's I know what, that, and he's the only guy who's actually seen the bones because he true. goes on to say, "Well, this is what he says." He says, "Fiorillo." did not focus on any of the mineralogical aspects of bone preservation. So the use of this paper, meaning his Fiorillo's paper, in support of Mori et al.'s 2016 claim is baffling. As a co-author of the two papers that are being misused, several colleagues have now contacted me requesting clarification on the state of fossilization of dinosaur bones in northern Alaska. The Mori et al. 2016 paper serves as a reminder that scientists are not only obligated to provide the supporting data for their conclusions, they're also obligated to cite their sources accurately. So Mori et al's source is Fiorillo. And Fiorillo yep. says in That's his true. response here, hey, look, to be clear, these suckers are fossilized, these suckers are permineralized. And if you use those terms loosely, you get into trouble because in the strict sense, permineralization, we got it. Fossilization, we got it. These are not bones anymore. Yeah. Right? In the quote unquote strict sense. But again, they are still bones. And um, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, what you said they're fossilized, permineralized bones. Anderson, let him sure. respond, please. Let me respond. What, what you said is completely wrong. 
the <laughs> Dr. Fiorillo is not the only person to have examined these bones. So Dr. Mori's mistake that he made, and, and English is, by the way, not his native language. Uh, so, but for whatever reason, he made a mistake in how he formatted his citation. And that's what led to the, the issue here. The way he worded his citation made it look, and this was misleading, but he made it look like Fiorillo had said that the bones were unpermineralized. And that's why Fiorillo got mad about it, because he never said that. Um, so it was very much a damage control type of situation of, wait a second, don't pull my name into this. I didn't say these bones are unpermineralized. That's that's what occurred. Uh, mm -hmm. However, the reason that Dr. Mori used that term was because of his own firsthand experience of the bone. And that's also why he stood by the description, even after Fiorillo objected to it. And again, as I as I uh, had actually stated during the presentation, it's not as if these two scientists are the only ones to have ever weighed in on these bones. Uh, Dr. Curry and Dr. Koppelhus also weighed in. He they called it they called these bones spectacular, and they said that they lack any significant degree of permineralization, and uh -huh. that they look and feel like old cow bones. And they were assumed to be bison bones. So uh, it's not, it's certainly not the case that Dr. Fiorillo is the only one to have examined them. In fact, they were laying around for 20 years, not being reported, because everybody who examined them thought they were bison bones. And um, again, what happened in the paper is that Maury had placed his citation in parentheses where he cited Fiorillo. He placed that parenthesis after the part where he said that they were unpermineralized. And so technically speaking, it gave the reader the impression that he was saying Fiorillo had said that. And in fact, Fiorillo never said that. So that was the mistake he made. Mm, but Well, let's pull up the... Um... He was absolutely not saying that they were uh, permineralized. He was saying, no, I stand by my description. These are unpermineralized. And, uh, you know, I apologize for any mistake mm -hmm. I made in my citation, but but they stood by their description of the bones as being. Well, let's pull up. Let's pull up that portion and let's read it together, because I don't think that's correct. Also, sorry, I need to jump in here. He said in his original paper, Fiorillo said there was a low degree of permineralization. There are degrees of permineralization. He brings it up in the paper. You were incorrect on that, Paul. Well, he didn't use the term unpermineralized, is what I'm saying. And and he would be the first to say, no, I didn't use that term. He he wants to say they're permineralized. And and, and that's technically true, but misleading, as we've shown here. So also, uh, also from Maury, Druckenmiller, and Erickson, we recognize that the bones are ferruginous. And color reflecting some degree of iron bearing mineral infiltration. Yeah. That is permineralization. The bones are permineralized just to a low degree. And what does that mean? Not uh, unpermineralized doc? bone. Like what, what that? does that mean? That, that does that mean that they could that they must not be millions of years old, or that they could be not millions of years old if there is a quote unquote low degree of permineralization? No, like, it has no mean? the permineralization is mainly affected by the context of the bones which as i said when i first got on here is a thick mudstone that doesn't let much water through so you would expect there to be a slow rate of permineralization right all right guys thank you for joining i think we've kind of run the course of this discussion donnie did you have anything else that you Wait, can, wanted? can you acknowledge what i said i've <laughs> Doc, you're just repeating yourself over and over. I've acknowledged what yes, you said. because you're wrong. Okay. Uh, I understand you think that, but uh, you haven't proven your, your case here tonight. Uh, you have reading from Sorry, the Sorry, but why is, why, is, uh, why is Doc wrong, Paul? So, Mr. Anderson, I would what I would suggest that you do is, after this stream tonight, go back and watch my presentation from the beginning. Um, so, and, and I think if you yeah. do that, you'll get the proper context to understand why this this challenge hasn't been answered. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry that I didn't like have the opportunity to. I I did have an intention of watching the whole thing, and like I said, I I read up on this before. Uh, you know, so I I, I don't mean to come in cold here, but um, yeah. Yeah, I I mean it seems to me that that Doc doesn't think that you've answered the the you know the the challenge and so you know I wanted to you know make sure that you did have the opportunity to uh, well, to respond. Well the challenge right? is to the critics and the skeptics the challenge is to the evolutionary community for you guys to explain how this collagen can be preserved for millions of years if these bones are millions of years old collagen decays far too quickly as Paul has demonstrated, which provides yeah. incredible evidence for the young earth creation position. We've gone for over two hours. The challenge has been engaged by the critics, but the mm -hmm. challenge has not been answered. It, it's been insufficient, oh, unfortunately, Mr. Actually, Anderson. Uh, on that really and quick, so, Paul, uh, you're I misrepresenting mean... that source about the collagen. Okay. Paul, are you misrepresenting the source on the collagen? Feel free to respond. But I don't want to. We're not going to keep having Doc go on his soapbox here tonight. I got to call. <laughs> I gotta, well, you're uh, lying about my field. I feel I've earned a soapbox. No, no, I'm afraid not. Okay, gentlemen, let me jump in because we. Well, hang uh, on. Why? Why not? I mean, if if Doc's an expert in this area and and uh, you know he's trying to correct you on something, you can't just shut him down. Like, doesn't seem entirely not, fair. Not an expert, but I am a paleontologist. Well, well, I would Paul call that an Doc expert. <laughs> Paul and Doc have engaged for we've been going five back. minutes of this show. All so right. Paul's point is, is, is they're just going in circles at this point. Is that right, Paul? Yeah, that's pretty much it. And I, and I don't think the audience wants to hear me say the word permineralized anymore. And uh, say permineralization ten times fast. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just you know, at this point, I think people are going to have to to read these articles for themselves and make up their own mind on uh, on this topic. So, But I, I think it's been an interesting and lively discussion. Yes, All it right, has. Well, thanks very much for uh, for indulging me in my ignorance. I appreciate it. No problem. All right. And, and Paul, I, I look forward to speaking with you again about your glorious mustache and uh, uh, potentially even the topic of genetic entropy. That would be a, that would be delightful. All right. Maybe we'll get that chance. I look forward to it. All right. Very good. I appreciate all the skeptics and the uh, critics that have joined. I am now going to put the show back to just Paul and I. And so, Paul, I think it's been a very enlightening show. I've had a lot of fun. We've had, as always, some great back and forth uh, dialogue and impromptu uh, debate. We've had a great audience. We've kept over 100 basically the whole time. Lots wow. of great uh, questions, feedback. And so we've we've put the challenge out there to the critics and the skeptics to join and to answer. Of course, one big reason why we do these live and we allow a mix of views and opinions in here because it's up to the audience. We want the audience to read the articles, to watch your presentation, Paul, my brother, and to assess the back and forth debate and discussion objectively. It's up to the audience to decide if, if the challenge has been answered, okay? And so, Paul, I want to hand it over to you, though, though um, because if, if you wouldn't mind, maybe just a summary of, of your thoughts. If you had to really break it down, a lot of this is technical. And so for, for the layperson in the, in the audience, how would you assess or how would you summarize the overall discussion and engagement over the last two hours from the uh, skeptics? So my question would then be, have they answered the challenge? And and briefly, why? If they haven't, why not, basically, Paul? Yeah, so I would definitely say they have not. Um, basically, uh, all, all it has been is two hours of, uh, you know, well, prove to me that there's collagen in these bones, you know. Prove to me that it it actually, that, that, that Dr. Thomas's research is actually valid. Prove it to me. Uh, you know, and so basically it's, it's been a lot of, uh, denialism, just a flat out, I'm going to ignore this because I don't want to believe it. So, uh, you know, if you want to look it up, go look it up. Collagen is a, is the structural component of bones that holds them together. It's, uh, 25 to 30% of the bone. And without collagen, you don't have a bone. 
And so, uh, yeah, these bones definitely have collagen. And uh, collagen does um, degrade at a rate that we can measure. Dr. Thomas did the measurement. And it doesn't line up with evolutionary ages. So um, that's, that's the challenge. And it hasn't been met. And it's not going to be met in my in my view, but uh, you know we'll we'll see what happens. But if if what we saw here tonight is any guide, I don't think we're going to see much in that in that uh, vein. But um, I absolutely enjoyed the opportunity to present this. This is one of one of these like really powerful, strong pieces of evidence that I think uh, creationists need to be more aware of, um, and and they need to use it. You know, just use it. <laughs> You, you've seen here tonight, they don't have an answer to it. So please use it. <laughs> it's a very powerful line of evidence to reiterate a couple things that you pointed out, Paul. You've done a fantastic job tonight. It is the structural component of bones that holds them together, collagen. These bones have collagen, okay? Not just these micro amounts like the evolutionists are attempting to argue or none at all. Collagen degrades at a measurable rate. Uh, as shown by Dr. Brian Thomas. Uh, he did his thesis on this. He focused on this. He knows his stuff. And the rate turns out to not line up with evolutionary ages, lines up with uh, young earth creation, biblical time. And so, Paul, I think this has been great. I did start a poll in the chat. So uh, audience, answer it objectively. It is have the critics answered the challenge, yes or no take your pick. I think this has been a lot of fun. I am looking at the questions that have come in, Paul, and there are some questions that are kind of off topic. So for those who sent in super chats with off topic questions, I do appreciate the support. You get a free question in our upcoming shows. Okay. So uh, make sure to tag me in our upcoming shows and let's just make sure we've addressed everything. Paul, I'm looking at we address Guts at Gibbons uh, question here. And so I think we're good. This has been comprehensive. Again, appreciate the work and time you put into this, Paul. You and I will have to chat about what uh, the next topic can be. Correct me if I'm wrong. We've done an open mic challenge on historical versus operational science. That we was did an one on genetic entropy. Yeah. One of my favorite topics. Although the last quarter of 2023, we, um, we definitely exhausted that topic, didn't we? Paul, we could probably uh, yeah. take a little break from that one. I'm going to take a little break on genetic entry, entropy for a while because honestly, I think uh, the ball is in the court of some of the more, um, you know, some of the more credentialed uh, commentators. I would like to see some of those guys, um, you know, uh, put in some more high level uh, discussion here. So, yes, but uh, but I enjoyed it. Yes, so have I. And okay. And then we did one today on dinosaur bones that shouldn't exist. Uh, we've gone over two hours. Time has flown by. So, Paul, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Let me just give a real quick shout out for another open mic that we have coming up this Thursday. So, I am just as excited for this one as I was for this, uh, for tonight. David M. Winsberg, he's published two technical abstracts at the uh, 2023 ICC. And uh, his abstracts dealt with solving the Genesis flood heat problem scientifically. And so he'll be here Thursday. He's going to give a two hour technical presentation on the topic. And we challenge all critics and skeptics. I know this is one of their favorite arguments. And so whoever you are in the world of evolution, make sure to be here on Thursday as we are looking forward to uh, engaging you in some debate on, again, the Genesis flood heat problem. Paul, God bless you. Any quick final words, final thoughts before we shut it down? God bless everybody. Take okay. care. Thank Take you. Take care. Standing for Truth is out. Bye.